I want to turn your volume down <laughs> so I'm not screaming in your ear. There's also some pencils up there. And actually, I need to grab a pencil too. And I would recommend these are super sharp pencils because I just sharpened them for you guys this morning. Um, you might want to, on the back of a scrap piece of paper, kind of file your pencil down a bit so that it's not so sharp. Because what can happen is the pencil gets so sharp it leaves grooves in the paper. And then when you paint on it, the paint kind of floods into those grooves. It can kind of mess with your vibe. All right. Can I see? I'm sorry. I'm this is old school teacher of me. Can I see a thumbs up if everybody has all the supplies that they need to get started? Great. Um, okay. So we're going to take one of our blank pieces of paper. Here we go down here. And all I want you to do first is just draw a circle. Very imprecise. And we're just going to get our pencils moving. We're going to get our paint wet. We're going to get the paper wet and just kind of get things flowing. And we're going to practice what our shading is going to look like when we start working on our actual mushroom pieces. So if this is a ball, a three-dimensional ball, we're going to pretend that the light is coming from here and it's shining down from the top right. So we're going to have a lot more light up here and it's going to be a lot darker down here. And I'm going to show you a couple techniques for achieving that. So pick any color that you would like. I'm going to do blue. The first thing we're going to do is we're just going to, with a clean brush, we're just going to fill in the circle with water, nothing else. And when we're trying to do like a, like a clean wash of paint, you want to kind of prime the paper with water first so that you don't get streaks and stuff. Okay. And then we're gonna get some paint on here and we're just gonna fill it in. Just kind of watch how the paint reacts, just kind of play with filling it in and getting a nice even coat of paint. It takes a little while to kind of figure out what texture of water you like best, because you'll notice that the water is gonna pool in some places, it's gonna be thinner other places, it's gonna dry in different temperaments at different parts of the paper. So we're just kind of getting acquainted because the water's going to do what the water's going to do. And we are just kind of along for the ride. So once you get a nice even wash on here, I'm going to show you two different ways that we can lighten up one of the areas. I'm gonna wash my brush off. I'm gonna dry it as thoroughly as I can. And I'm gonna take this dry brush and I'm gonna brush it over this area up on the top right where I want there to be less pigment. And I'm pulling up the paint off the paper. Let me move these out of the way. Adding a little bit more water to it will disperse the paint even more, pull it up off the paper so that you can kind of get this lightening effect here. And then the other thing you could do, I'm gonna fill this back in real quick so I can show you, is you can just do that with a piece of paper towel. So 
So later on, when we're trying to get, there we go. When we're trying to get some different uh, gradients of color, these are a couple different ways we can accomplish that. And then while this bottom left corner is still wet, you can kind of spread the, the paint around to make sure that it's gonna take some more color. We get a little bit more pigment on the brush and just kind of tap it along that bottom edge and drop in some more color. We're gonna get a little bit more of a darker hue. Any questions up until up to this point or just like funky things happening on your paper? Okay. Um, you want it to be you um, let's see. It, you want it to not drip off of your off of your paper. Um, so once we get started working on the actual pieces that we're going to do, I like to keep a separate sheet of paper next to me. And then every time I mix a color, because when you mix a color in the pan, it's going to look one way in the pan and it's going to look different on the paper. And I always do a little swatch on the paper before I add it to my painting. And that way it removes a lot of that excess drippy water. But the amount of water in your brush should, should not be dripping. Sorry, this might be a really short question, but like in terms of order of like dip, paint. Sure. What is like the optimal? Um, Let's find out because I've never been asked that. So I'm just going to see what it is yeah. that I do. So I usually get my brush a little bit wet before I go into the paint and then I get a little paint, I brush it around, I test it on the paper. And then if it's a little bit too wet, then I might put a little bit on the paper towel and then go back in and get a little bit more. Um, so it's really up to you. I like to put, um, I like to put a wet paint brush in onto my paint palette. Are those um, dot cards working well for everybody who's who has one? Okay, cool. Okay. Can I get sort of like a thumbs up if we're ready to like move on to the next thing? Cool, okay. The next thing we're gonna do is a little bit of color mixing. Um, we're gonna work on mixing kind of a couple different types of gray. This is what we're gonna be painting this evening. We're gonna do these blue oysters and this uh, fly agaric amanita. And you'll notice that the, the gray isn't gray. So if you can find the gray on your palette and just get it wet and put it on your scratch piece of paper, it looks like this. It's just a little bit flat in terms of gray, um, especially for the blue oysters. Oops, is this frozen on me? Oh, there it goes. See how there's like a little bit of a fleshy yellow tint to this gray? So we're gonna want to, on your mixing palette, get a little bit of the gray. And then if you have one of the uh, dot cards, the some of the yellow ochre, just a little bit and mix it. And then check it out on your swatch card. I just think this looks a little bit more dynamic and realistic in terms of what the gray color on the mushrooms looks like. Um, but you might also decide that you want it to have a little bit of a blue tint. So you might want to tap a little bit of blue onto there. So you can kind of decide, here's some uh, gray mixed with blue, here's some gray mixed with the yellow ochre. Um, and you can kind of just decide for yourself which one you're liking best. 
because we're probably going to have to mix that gray a couple of different times. So you'll want to know like, oh, it's like, you know, two parts gray to one part, one part yellow ochre or um, aquamarine. So once you kind of arrive at a gray color that is your, that your artistic eye says that it represents a mushroom the best. Mine is usually right around here. I'm just gonna. We want your gray to be pretty transparent because it's 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 going to look the to the eye it's going to look white, but on white paper it's going to look. Yeah, but I think it's it. The more water you add, the, the more, more yes, the more water, the more transparent. And so I can use just um a little bit because the white is gonna make it a little milky and it's gonna it's gonna change the, the, the color. Mm -hmm. So you'd want um maybe in here just make a dot mm -hmm. of the black mm -hmm. with a little bit more water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then some of this right here, that like yellow colors. And then if you need to like borrow from anybody, you can like straight black. Like that's um, and then I'm gonna, the, it looks a little different on the screen here. I'm gonna see if I can hold this up closer. Come on. Okay. Oops. Here we go. So this is kind of how transparent it looks. I don't know why this is like a second lagging on me. Here we go. This is how transparent they're looking. So with watercolor, we're always building on layers. So we're going to paint the lightest color of the painting first. That goes down first. And then you preserve the lightest colors as you add layers. So um, we want to keep the first couple of layers that we put down really transparent so that we can add to it. And then if it gets a little bit dark, then we know some of those techniques for pulling up a little bit of the color. And then people online are asking about where is the PDF of the mushroom? So we don't have that. So let's just put them in view. Sure, yeah. And maybe we can put your water out of view a sure. bit. Is that going to be okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Can everybody see online? And then I also have uh, sketches of it. So when we actually start working on it, we'll be working from these. So you'll be able to follow along a little bit easier. And I made ones that you can trace. So if you don't like drawing, because this is a painting class and not a drawing class. Um, if I had to draw things in front of you, I would not be here. So I did it ahead of time. Um, and then just to kind of show you as an example, even though this blue is dry, I can still get it wet and it's, a, it's still a little bit malleable. So if you do end up kind of, you know, wanting to go back and edit a little bit, you just kind of want to massage, massage the paint a little bit and you can pull some back and go from there. All right. Now we're gonna learn a fun skill. So you'll notice that for these gills, we want to have some nice like foldy, fleshy looking tech, like texture. That's the word I'm looking for. So I'm gonna take a little bit of my gray. And just on this, open space that I have here. I'm so like nervous. So my hands are a little shaky. So, um, well, thank you. Um, we're going to do lightly drag, slowly press and then release. So it's going to look like this. Like that. And then we'll do 
another one next to it that kind of like fits into it. So you want to just kind of play with how um, how fine you can get that line. Even though these are pretty thick brushes, uh, they will make quite fine lines. And then play a little bit with trying to do a little bit of directionality with it. So let's say we want it to kind of go in this direction. We'll follow it. And it's okay if that fine line even disappears a little bit, because what we're really wanting is these little, these grooves. And that's going to give it a little bit more dimension than if, than if we just drew straight lines onto the mushrooms. Someone on Zoom asks, what size brush? What size is this one? This one is a six. I I use lots of different sizes, but it looks like my two, the two that I use the most are both sixes. And then you can kind of play with having there be longer or skinny stretches and longer like dips with the brush. <laughs> but I'll kind of come around and see how that's working. Let me know if you're like find, finding anything difficult. Yeah. And you might even um, you might even just play with seeing how fine of a line you can make with your brush. So even if it's pretty loaded with water, this tip can make. really fine lines. And then I even kind of like it when it's so, uh, the line is so delicate that it kind of breaks a little bit and kind of gives this like dotted effect, um, which I think just works nicely with like it for like the illustration effect of it. And then take the, take the pressing really slow. So it's really gradual. Here we go. And then also know that we can you can do the line however you want when we're finally at the after lucky. This is just sort of like the technique that I've arrived at that I think makes it um, just makes it come alive more. All right, I think we're gonna move on to starting our sketches.
So we're gonna get our two clean pieces of paper and we're gonna start out, let me just kind of like talk through the processes of how we're gonna do these two pieces, the order that we're gonna do everything in. Because we have to build the layers, we have to know what layers we're gonna do when ahead of time, uh, especially for doing the, um, what do you call these? Uh, the partial veil yeah, remnant, so right? Mm -hmm. The spots. <laughs> Um, so we're going to be, to for the Amanita, we're going to be using some masking fluid. That's what the toothpicks are for. It's liquid latex. So after we sketch this out, we're going to put the, the dot patterns on, let that dry, and then paint over it, and it will repel the watercolor and leave those spots white. And then we, we rub it off with your hand or an eraser, and then it will leave the white, and then we can kind of go back in and add whatever, whatever color we want on top of that. If you are at home and you don't have some of this uh, masking, you can go back and add either with some white paint, uh, with a white gel pen, or you can try using the, uh, like the lifting technique so you could paint it. And then what I've done before is take a little piece of paper towel and put it on the end of your paintbrush and then kind of like dab at it where you want to lift the color up. Um, but for us here tonight, we'll be using some of this. So first we're going to sketch our Amanita out and give it its first gray wash. And then while that wash is drying, we will sketch our blue oyster and give that its first gray wash. And then we'll come back to this one to start doing the gills um, and the Remnant will be kind of bouncing back and forth depending on which of our pieces is still wet so that we can be continuously working and not be sitting waiting for those pieces. So let's start out sketching our Amanita. So, absolutely. Um, so, if you would like to use a different reference photo, but the same painting, te painting techniques, that is totally fine. I just try to kind of simplify things as much as possible. Did you have another question? I would do it, I would do it loose because we're gonna be, go, I would tear it out because we're going to be going back and forth and we don't wanna, you don't wanna fold another piece of paper on top of your wet artwork. Um, I also have, let's see, some of these photocopies that you can trace if you would like to do tracing and you can go hold them up to a window because the watercolor paper is not super great at seeing through um but i just you when i trace this from the ones that i'm handing out and i just held it up to a window and traced it with pencil um but i will still walk through the steps if you would like to do the sketching yourself or if you would prefer, if you're like, just let me at it and you have a different reference photo or you can do it just by looking at this, then that's fine too. So we're doing kind of a style where we are sketching within lines. We're not doing free painting because we want to know where the, where the edges of the shapes that we're making are. Um, and so that we don't run different colors into each other. Um, and we will go after everything is all dry, you, we can erase the pencil. After the watercolor is dry, it will erase the pencil and not the watercolor, which is pretty cool. I don't, those are my only cheat cards. Once you're done with your cheat card, just let me know and we'll take this one out. Gonna go I will. Yes. So if you're working yourself uh, and feel free to get up and go like hold it up to a window or something if you want to go trace it um, and then just meet us back here. Um, but if you're going freehand, then I would start with this big oval shape here. <laughs> nice big oval shape. And then from that oval shape, we're gonna kind of cut it in half with the top of the 
cap here. So we'll do this line across. And then there's kind of, because we're, we're looking at it kind of from a little bit underneath the mushroom. So this piece of the gills is kind of like coming down and then back up to meet the cap. So we're gonna take another line from the cap. We're gonna kind of swoop down, go across the top and then down to meet the end. So I'll kind of like make that line darker so you can see what I'm doing here. And it's definitely like, you know, make as make as many big swooping shapes as you need to. You can we can always go back and erase the sketching and we're going to be painting over it and removing the pencil anyway. So as long as we get the the general shape, then that will work. Then we're going to add uh, from underneath this gill line that we just drew. We're going to add the little skirt. So I did just the outline, the bottom, and then I kind of just added these little folds on here. And then you can trace out how you want the stem to be shaped, the stipe. And we don't need to draw on every single gill line, but what you want to have on your sketch is a guide of the direction that the gills are going in. So in this middle section, they're kind of like eyelashes. So they're, they're along the edge of it, they're swooping up in the, you know, the ones on the right side are kind of swooping to the right, the ones on the left side are swooping to the left. And the gills that are closest to you are going to be a little bit farther apart. And then the ones that are further away from you in the back will be a little bit more fine and closer together. But from the back, you want to take these two points and have every single remaining gill line start from this point. So it will follow this line and meet the edges all from that point. And that will give the appropriate perspective that the gills are coming from the center and then meeting the edge of the cap all the way around. Yes. So we kind of have two sections of gill here because it's um, in the front, this part of the gill is like coming out towards us and these ones are going out in a different direction. So this middle section here, we're gonna draw the gills on kind of like eyelashes. So we're gonna have the gills, they're pretty evenly spaced out. On the right, they'll kind of swoop up to the right. On the left, they'll swoop to the left. But then the remaining gills that are in the back are all gonna start from these two points. And we'll follow those lines on the top and evenly kind of space them out along these edges. But the origin point of all of them will be these two corners. That can be well, painting mushrooms and making sure that the gill lines are going in the right direction is for me the most difficult part because I've gotten 90% of the way through and been like, oh my gosh, that's not even how that's supposed to look. <laughs> so while we're sketching, I'm gonna come around wherever you guys are mixing, whatever pan you're using to mix, or if you're using a um, just a dot card and mixing on the paper, I will uh, give you a little bit of this masking fluid and you're also gonna need uh, a toothpick. This is 
<laughs> Some of you are going rogue, and I love it. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Do you need two picks? Are you not leaving yeah. around? Mm -hmm. And then are you going to from a different? Mm -hmm. All right. The stuff is like a little sticky. So just be aware. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, well, actually. I mean, I have you to share this one because I think that's Um, do you want to do this? I can talk a little bit. Sure. It's gonna um, force it into my house and it turns into a little bit of a Get a little bit of masking. Too. I gotta go get a toothpick. Um, if you're following along at home and you don't have masking, the other thing that you could do is draw out where you want the remnant spots to be, and you can just paint around them so that that stays white. Um, or you can add the white. Okay. So now we're going to add our spots onto here. So we're going to kind of load up the toothpick and we're going to make some pretty imprecise shapes. You want some of them to be kind of like oblong and then some of them to just be small and fine. And then they tend to, if I'm thinking correctly, they tend to be a little bit more like concentrated up near the, the top in the center and then like around the edges. Um, so if you want a little bit of accuracy there, but you could also spell your name out in them or make weird kitten shapes or do something else experimental with it. So once we get these spots on, or if you're at home and you're just drawing these out, we're going to let this dry and it will get kind of plasticky and rubbery. And while it dries, we will sketch out our other mushrooms. And then we'll come back to this when it's ready for us. Um, also just as a, as a note, um, when I use masking and I use masking on almost all of my paintings. Sometimes I use the masking to actually create the, um, the shape of the gills. And then I paint over the gills so that the masking preserves that white shade for the gills. 
Um, but I use a paintbrush. Um, that will be maybe in another class, a <laughs> different skill. Um, but if you're using a paintbrush with the masking, uh, if you're at home using this, uh, the best thing to do to preserve your paintbrushes so that it doesn't get all gummed up with latex is to get a bar of soap and get your brush wet and kind of coat the outside of your brush with some soap before you dip it into the masking. And then the masking will kind of slide off from the soap, but it won't actually permeate the bristles of your brush. And then you can just rinse it and it doesn't ruin your paintbrushes. I'm really sorry if everybody's following along at home and you can just hear me heavy breathing into this microphone. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so when when you paint the gills on, you don't really need to follow the the pencil lines and the pencils. Um if they're really just a guide for where you're supposed to paint. And then um we'll erase all the pencil after the water flows through mm -hmm. so the eraser will take off the pencil lead, but not the outer. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And what we'll do when we start painting the gills is I actually usually lightly erase the pencil lines because I'm just using them as a guide and I'm never going to get the paint to be as thin as a pencil line anyway. And I just use them as a guide to make sure the things are going in the right direction. And then um, so we don't have to be, the, the sketch is there really just to give form and like boundary to each of the shapes. And you're welcome to come up to the table here if you need to you need to see what's what's happening. All right. I am going to set up the sketch for the next one. If anybody is ready to move on. Um, when you finish your masking, um, just set your set that piece of paper up and out of the way, and it should be dry by the time we come back to it um, in a little bit to finally start adding some paint. Just as a thumbs up show of hands, is anybody finished with their masking, or do we need some more? Just a few. All right, we'll leave a few more minutes here. We're just doing it. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 I was just mentioning it. Some, sometimes when I paint mushrooms, I use a brush. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's really, yeah, doing the masking with a brush is, I really like somebody recommends doing a whole, I can do the whole class of just doing the, the masking techniques. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, feel free definitely to uh, use the specimens in front of you if you would like to use a live specimen instead of a sketch for the for the oysters. And I'm going to be doing 
I'm going to be doing blue, but you're welcome to do yellow or pink or and you know and ones that you want. And feel free to break pieces off. Um, if there's a lot on each block, so yeah. And people, you all can go on the beach too. Are there available seats for this one? Actually, okay. Thank you. Okay. And no shame. Facing <laughs> game. So I'm going to kind of talk through the uh, sketching out for the oyster. So I would start with this shape here, the outside. Also, if you choose to just do one of these, or or if you're going to you know use the um, specimen, the live specimens in front of you, um, feel free to just. Just do one or just do, you know, choose a different. There's somebody over here who's painting a beautiful collection of like 20 of them. Excited to see that. <laughs> oh, sure. All right. So we're going to start out with this big shape here. And then obviously the the oysters that I'm painting are in a different kind of phase than the ones that are in front of you. Um, and so the the gills might look a little bit different. The ones in the in your live specimens look a little more a little more straight, a little less wrinkly. Um, and yeah, so you can very loosely follow follow the uh, guidelines here. But uh, then I'm going to do this shape around the outside, and this is going to be the part of the cap that is folding over the top of the oyster mushroom. And then we'll create these side pieces wider up at the top and getting a little thinner down near the bottom, kind of a chanterelle shape. And then again, the gill lines are going to kind of follow the follow the edge of the top and along the along the sides here. Uh, some of them are going to be different in length, but in general, we want them to be kind of like up and out. Can you tell? I've never taught anybody how to paint these before. <laughs> so, and that's just for the, sort of this inner column. And you can leave these uh, spaced out because we're going to be using that, that drag and press technique for these. So we want to have enough space to do that, do the pressing. But you don't have to paint, draw and paint every single gill line. We're just putting guides here so that the direction of it is accurate. And then we're going to do the same thing that we did over here, where we're going to have these two vanishing points for the gills. So from these two points is where all of the other gill lines are going to extend. So from here, they'll follow up, follow up and along here, and then they'll also go down this way. And since those ones are kind of farther away from your eye, they'll be a little bit closer together. And you can kind of see from this example, I did the, oh, is this gonna, I don't know if this is very clear. Um, I used that drag and press technique for this central area, 
but then back here just to do the the lines for the gills in the back it's it's just lines so it won't be too laborious getting that part done Sixty-five. Okay, and then I'll go back through and delete or delete erase this little line here. We're almost ready to put some paint on. I promise. Then for this other one over here, whatever kind of oblong, weird shape you want to make. I just like it to show that kind of as the oyster mushroom grows out, it kind of looks like it's kind of flowing off the edge of where it's growing from. So this side is usually a little bit droopier, larger, hangs off the edge a little bit more. Any questions on on the room? So yeah, and we, again, you only have to do a few. So you want to do one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Anything you want to do? You just want to generally follow the direction. There are some, there are some like smaller, smaller. Yeah, all right, I think our masking is dry too. And again, you don't have to draw on every single gill line. It's really, we really just want the general direction of where things are going. And then the last thing we'll do as uh, we finish up sketching, I've got some of these big erasers and we just want to very lightly kind of go over the sketch so that we can see what we drew but that there isn't so much um, pencil. We wanna still be able to see where things are going. And that, yeah, make sure not to rub off the uh, masking. And we wanna be delicate around that because we're gonna use erasers to take that masking off after. Sure, and then you can use this one too. You will still be able to erase a uh, pencil after it's finished, but this just makes it easier. You don't have to rub the watercolor so hard after. Great. And then we are ready to start adding some paint, finally. We're an hour in, we're finally painting at the painting class. Who'd have thought? Um, but the next couple parts should go pretty quickly and it'll all start coming together. So I'm gonna start mixing my gray. Uh, um, the way <laughs> I usually, I'm gonna do two different tones of gray because I really like the uh, 
I really like the oysters to have a little bit more of a yellow fleshy tone. And I like the Amanita to have a little bit more of a blue tone just because I like how it looks with the red. But honestly, any shade of gray is going to look fantastic. And I'm going to double check with my swatch card to make sure that I'm got the right color here. Um, don't be afraid of how dark it might look. It's going to dry lighter. So we want it to still be transparent, but um, sure. Can you still see that? Okay. Um, but it's okay if it looks a little bit dark because it'll dry a bit lighter. And I'm going to give my Amanita its first wash. So with a clean brush, I'm just going to go in and get all the parts that are going to be gray wet because I'm just kind of priming the paper to receive some pigment. And I'm going to do all the sections of the gill, the entire skirt, and the whole stipe. And then remember that your pencil is just a guide. So if you end up kind of making a, a different shape out of the paint, then that is totally fine. Okay. And now that this is all wet, this is gonna help draw the watercolor to the edges of the whole part that's wet so that you don't have streaks on your paper. Because when you go straight onto the paper with watercolor, the watercolor, um, the paper, the grooves in the paper just start sucking up all of the liquid and you'll get brush strokes, streaks, and um, it won't look as even. Uh, just the part that is going to be gray. So all of the gills, the skirt, and the stipe. And then we're gonna use kind of the similar uh, technique we did at the beginning with the sphere to kind of get the, the shading that we want. So now that I've got my first wash on here, now I'm going to think about if the light is coming from this, the, from the top right, um, like you're in, in school and we used to draw like this, the sun in the top right corner of, the, of your paper, um, then it's gonna be a little bit lighter on the right side and a little bit darker on the left side. So I'm gonna take my clean dry brush and I'm gonna go over this side and I'm just going to pick up some of the, the paint and let it soak back into my brush to take some of the paint off. And then I'm going to drop a little bit more pigment onto the opposite side. Just going to like tap along the edge. And then just kind of let it let it blend however it wants to blend. We'll also have a little bit more of a shadow kind of right under the, where the skirt sticks out. And then we're also gonna have a little bit more shading on the, I guess I'll call it like the back part of the gills, which would be down here. So I'm gonna drop a little bit more pigment into this area.
And this is the first wash. You're kind of barely going to see this part. This is just getting pigment on. We're going to paint the gills over the top. It's really just giving your eye a sense of, you know, knowing what's going on directionally. And then since everything's wet, sometimes the pigment that you put down is going to like dissipate a little bit and you'll be like, I just put a shadow there. Where did it go? It kind of disappeared in there. So we just add a little more. And then I'm going to lighten up this side. You can use your brush or kind of like a little crumpled up piece of paper towel to get the kind of lift off some pigment there. But, so. And then I'm going to start uh, doing the same thing on the oyster because we already have the gray mixed and going. And then we'll kind of do the fun, colorful parts after that. So similar concept, we're gonna give it a wash. We're gonna give it some gradient. Oops, it's a little bit too yellow for me. Here we go. So again, I'm gonna get all of the parts that are gonna be gray to be wet first. And that just really helps everything blend much better. It's a lot harder to try to blend watercolor onto dry paper. Um, and I've had people ask before, like, how do I know how much water is, like, how do I know what is the right amount of water on the paper, but not too wet? You don't want to have pools of water. You just want to have, like, if you look at it sideways, a little bit of a sheen of water. And I'm going to drop my color in here. Somebody asked me recently, what do you listen to when you paint? Because a lot of times for me, um, I do most of my, 
most of my painting happens in my head because it's a lot of planning, like what, um, what layers have to go on first, what sections need to all be wet at the same time, and then what needs to go on after that. And so um, I usually do a lot of planning and then an entire painting will kind of come out in a day. I'll spend the, just the entire day going from start to finish. Um, and I tend to like really repetitive, um, something really repetitive. But one time I did an entire painting just listening to the Broadway musical soundtrack of Hades Town for like 16 hours it was just, I think I listened to it like six times. So, so I'm going back in here uh, on these oysters and just adding a little bit of shading in these areas under the, under the cap. I made the shadow a little bit, added a little bit of blue. And just like how that looks. And then I'm gonna add a little shading on the left sides and try to pull up a little paint on the right side just to get the, the, the first layer is always imprecise. We're just kind of sculpting things out. There we go. So then our brains have a general idea of where these exist in space. Take a you know, dry brush um, yeah, and use those and just try to like dust off some of those little pieces so that it's still, it'll dry with the paint. If you need to pull up any paint, if you put some down, it's a little bit too dark or anything, you can with a wet brush. Just kind of like massage the area with a wet brush um, and then use that paper towel to, to dab up the paint. If you've got your gray faces down, then on your scratch paper or your kind of color swatch paper, um, you can start playing around with the reds of just mixing a few different shades of red because we're gonna want a little bit of a gradient on the top of the amida. Uh, at the very top, it's gonna be a really deep red. So you might even add, uh, you'll, you'll wanna use uh, on your dot cards, there's a deep red and a pale red. You'll want to use the deep red, but you can add a little bit of charcoal, add a little bit of aquamarine just to give it that more deep maroon. And then towards the edges and the bottom, it will fade to a little bit more of an orangey, bright fire engine red. So you can kind of just play with uh, mixing what colors you think will look best. And we'll want to make sure that we don't add red paint until the underside of the gills is completely dry. Because what'll happen is you'll catch a wet edge of that gray, and then all of the red is gonna rush into wherever it's wet. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll wanna make sure that everything's dry under that cast before we paint on. Mm -hmm. 
if you have any pooling uh, or like puddles in your painting, uh, you can get your brush completely dry on a big towel and then just press your brush into it and it, the brush will soak back up those pooling spots. <clears throat> Does anybody need more uh, paper, like a piece of scrap paper for mixing or anything? Um, is everybody's Amanita? Are the gills dry and the masking dry? You can give me a, a thumbs up. You can kind of um, tap on the masking and just make sure that it's not that it's dried thoroughly. It should kind of look a little bit more clear now, too. Yes, yep, it should be tacky. Okay, but it shouldn't like pop like a bubble. So mine is ready to start adding some red. We're gonna finally get some color going on here. So I'm gonna start with the brightest color. So I'm actually gonna kind of mix my, my orangey shade and then I will drop in the darker red on the top after. So I'm just mixing this to get it ready. And then I will go in and get all that cap area wet with a clean brush. Just. If you're, when you start painting the red, if the red starts bleeding into the gray, if the gray isn't completely dry, then put a paper towel on it and try to stop that red from bleeding through. And then we will come back to it. We'll wait until it's all dry. So here's what the masking is gonna look like when you paint over it. This is the fun part. So the masking is going to repel the watercolor and it will leave all of those spaces white underneath. So we'll do all of our layering and stuff around the masking. And then when it's all finished, we'll rub it off. What's that? The hat got a wash. Yep. <laughs> so again, with the shading, the light is coming from the top right. So it's going to be a little bit like brighter up on the top right and darker onto the left side. And then just because of the way that the, uh, like the Amanita starts out in like an egg shape um, and it's you know, covered with the, like completely covered in a white veil. And then as it opens up, the veil splits off, off into these pieces. But then as it stretches, the deep red kind of stretches out into lighter colors. So we're gonna have a lot more of that deep red color at the, at the top, kind of concentrated up at the top, and then a little bit lighter orangey at the, um, like the ring around the edges. And then I'm even gonna take my brush and I'm gonna kind of drag the edge of the cap a little bit further down around the gills over here so that it wraps around a bit. Okay. 
Okay. So everyone's masking working. <laughs> All right, and then I'm gonna use a little bit of my aquamarine from earlier um, to get this kind of maroon shade and kind of add tap that in up near the top edge. There. Now it's finally looking like what we wanted to do. <laughs> so what we'll do is get the um And again, the, the, the purpose isn't necessarily to get it to come out exactly right the first time you try to paint it, but that as you're as you're working, hopefully you're kind of being like, oh, if I do it this way, this happens. But if I try it this way, then that happens. Um, so that later on, you can kind of apply these same techniques again. <laughs> But I've definitely had multiple experiences where, you know, my wet brush touched an area of the paper that was also wet and it just blooms the wrong color. Um, what happens? But the thing that I love about watercolor too is that you could paint the same thing every day for a year and it would never come out the same way because depending on the humidity in the room or how wet or dry your brush was, or sometimes even the temperature of the water kind of changes the cohesion of the water. Like there's just so many different variables. Um, you're never going to get it to be exactly what you want it to be. And so there's kind of a refreshing amount of letting go of control <laughs> in that uh, experience. So then we're going to let that red dry and we'll go back over and start uh doing our oysters so if you are using uh yellow you can do yellow i like i'm partial to the to the blue so i use aquamarine with a little bit of charcoal just to kind of um damp it down, get it, give it, get it a little earthier. This is the shade that I like the best. Okay. 
And we're going to give it a really, really light wash because we want to be able to have, see here, we want to be able to have these lighter areas. So it's always, it's, you can always add layers, but it's a lot harder to take layers off after they've dried. Um, and then again, make sure that your gray underneath is completely dry before you start adding the blue on there so it doesn't bleed in there. Oops, and I forgot to, yeah, yes, we are. Thank you for reminding me. I'm kind of doing it while I, um, you just reminded me. But yeah, that just, it makes it go on so much smoother when you just apply paint straight to the paper. You're constantly having to smooth out your brush strokes, but when it's wet already, then the paint just kind of places itself where you've laid a path for it. We're really inviting the paint to work with us rather than trying to exert control over it. It's a whole life lesson. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then in terms of kind of the shading for the blue, I am keeping this area where it would be in the kind of direct light to be a little bit brighter and then a little bit more pigment around the edges. Is there anything you're kind of noticing about this process or were you expecting one thing and then a different thing is happening? Any kind of like commentary anybody wants to offer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. I also think that just like once you get you you kind of have to get acquainted with the process every time you start. And so whenever you're going to sit down to paint, it's always worth it to do a little practice activity or just do a little do a circle and drop some paint into it and just see how the water's behaving that day and see how steady your hand feels and just kind of um it's very difficult to just sit down and try to paint something exactly like you see it um and i don't know where i was going with that but <laughs> just giving yourself an oppor opportunity to kind of find that flow like you were talking about I've never in my life had people watch me while I'm painting. So this is a little weird. <laughs> oh, thank you. Has anybody ever listened to um, when Terry Gross was on Fresh Air on NPR? I've had a lot of people say that I sound like I should be on NPR. <laughs> All right, cool. So this is where this is where we are.
I see lots of different kind of like styles coming through, which is very cool. Some of you guys have your lines drawn with like black pen, so it's a little more like illustration esque. All right, I am going to pop back over to my Amanita and I'm going to take a, a little bit of my red that is mixed with a darker color, whether that is a little bit of blue or a little bit of gray. And everywhere that I've put the masking, I'm just going to add a tiny little like shadow underneath it. So I'm just going to paint the bottoms of like each of those little spaces. And what that's going to do when you kind of look at it here, is it's just going to give that a little bit more of like a 3D depth when we take the masking off. So you can go like right over the masking again and just give each, each one its own little shadow. Uh, I'm using my my red that I used for the cap, but I've mixed it with like a little bit of blue and a little bit of gray just to make it a little bit darker. So it still has the the red tone, but it's giving a shadow onto the red. And then from there, I think we'll start depending on which um, If I can get some feedback, does anybody have, are both of your paintings wet? Mm -hmm. Some of you has, okay. Um, so we want to try to get, give one of them some breathing space so that we can start adding the, uh, the gills. I think I'm going to start my, I think I'm going to do my Amanita first. Um, as we do the gills, we're going to mix the same color gray that we used for the wash, but we're just going to add a little bit more pigment. So it'll be a little bit more dense, a little bit darker. Um, and as you do the, the gill lines, you can also kind of go back in and give the skirt a little bit of outline and texture so that it kind of sticks out a little bit, stands out a little bit more. And uh, for the Amanita, I'm just going to use straight lines. So for our first set of gills, Let's not try to do our, our drag, drag and press technique. We'll just kind of get used to doing some fine lines for the Amanita gills. And up until now, we've been doing wet on wet. So we've been adding a wet brush to wet paper. Now we're doing wet on dry. So we have a layer of dry paint underneath. We won't do a wash underneath because we want to get the paint to just move in very specific lines. Um, so I'm gonna start by just kind of, oh, this is a little bit too dark. I'm gonna start by just giving this kind of demarcation its own outline here. And I'm going to give the give the skirt a little little depth here. Because eventually we are going to erase the pencil lines. So if we want that outlined, we'll do that there. And then again, the gills on the Amanita are just, just little, very fine eyelashy swoops. That's the technical term, eyelashy swoops. Mm -hmm. 
Again, it's okay if you don't match up every single line that you drew with a pencil, or if you add more paint lines than you had in pencil, then that's fine too. As long as the direction is going in the right direction. Thank you so much for coming. Are you going to the restroom or are you leaving? Okay. Thought maybe it was bedtime <laughs> for the little one. All right. And then again with the uh, Amanita, we're gonna start all of our gill lines on this lower section. Good. Uh, starting from that, these kind of two vanishing points on the side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do a couple that are really spread out and far away from each other. Instead of trying to get every single line in a, in a neat row, I'll just do a few. And then I'll go in and fill in where I kind of think that they should be. I've noticed that just in terms of my own ability to identify mushrooms or to observe identifiable features, trying to learn how to paint gills is a really great way to learn gill patterns and the, the ways that um, the gills might have folds or where they're attached on the mushroom because, um, um, Angel, what's the, what are the, the terms for when the gills end at a fixed spot versus when they end decurrent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a term for when the, when the gills kind of trail off similar, like on a, on an oyster mushroom versus when they end at the exact same spot all the way around in a circle. Um, and so learning how to paint them or to try to be so observational that you're right up in there, like trying to, to copy what it looks like, I think is a really great skill for just like mushroom ID in general. Okay. Ooh, what's going on here? It's trying to like focus. Just go back. Oh, just that I've noticed that that approach. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, we're for the for the gills on the MD, we're not doing the, the dragging and pressing thing, we're just kind of doing really hard. Okay, so, um, I would start. By giving yourself this line that kind of goes straight across and kind of breaks the top section of the gill and the bottom section or the front section and the back section. And then this top part here, we've very professionally called it the eyelashy technique. And then from here, we kind of have that, that vanishing point that we're connecting all the lines to. After we uh, finish up and you take these home, you can add four shadows and layers on top of this piece if you would like to continue practicing it. Um, I think if we had more time, I would have given us about six more shading stages, but in the interest of time, we are just doing our best. I'm gonna get started over on the gills of 
my blue oyster. Again, I'm gonna mix a shade of gray that's a little bit darker than the one that I, I laid underneath. Um, I just wanna show as an example, I don't think we're gonna have time to do as many layers of this as I would have liked to, but you'll notice that there are, there are two different colors inside each of these gills. So if this was the, the, the practice gills, I would do one layer of the gills and then I would go back over the top again to add a second layer of a shadow inside each of like kind of the little wells of the gill. And it just gives it a lot more depth. And you, you wanna add that shadow right up against the, the white. And that just gives it more of a sense. You can kind of see it with the, these two examples. The one over here looks a lot deeper. You, it looks like there's a crease that you're looking into that kind of slightly um, shades out. So we might only get to one layer of the gill pattern for tonight, but then if you wanted to go back, even with just a pencil um, or another layer of gray, I in when I paint oysters, I always have those two layers of gray color that just gives it a lot more depth, I think. Uh, yep, so we'll make it a little bit, um, just a little bit darker. So it'll be more pigment, less water. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna outline the edges of kind of the body of this oyster mushroom. And then I'm gonna put maybe two or three uh, gill marks across the top. And then I will fill in from there. So instead of trying to do every single gill line from left to right, you'll eventually get crowded. You'll eventually kind of lose the directionality of it because um, we want that kind of trumpet shape. Um, so we want to kind of fill, fill them in little by little. And then I always like to start from the top so that as I add the gill line, I can kind of let the gill lines trail off at the bottom because some of them will be a little bit longer. Some of them will go further down the stipe than the others. And in order to fill that, in order to create the trumpet shape, we're, we'll have more smaller, shorter lines in between the longer ones. There's, you know what I'm going to do when I get home is I'm going to look up what the names for all of these terms that I'm using are because I'm like, do the trumpety thing with the. So I'm very lightly dragging, pressing, lifting, pressing, lifting. And then I'm going to do one over here. Dragging. Pressing, dragging, pressing. Here. So I've just put those three on and then I'll kind of use those as guidelines to put some more right up next to those. So now that I'm kind of pressed for space here, as these are getting closer together, um, you can connect some of them. 
And you can also add just kind of like shorter ones. So I'll have one that might just like end right there. Um, Angel, in the interest of time, we might just do one one side of it because I want people to be able to finish the the Amanita. So might just kind of pause on the rest of the oysters so that we can kind of do that on the. Um, for these gill lines that are in the back here, I'm just going to use straight lines. I'm not going to use the the dragging and pressing technique, but I am going to just. Uh, make sure that I maintain this vanishing point and I'm just going to do some really fine lines here and that just gives it the impression that we're looking at it from underneath and that cap is kind of cascading outward So we'll work on that for another minute and then we'll go over to our Amanita and take the masking off. All right, I'm going to take the masking off of my Amanita over here. Um, you can do this with your hands or very gently with a pencil eraser. And we're just going to rub back and forth until the masking kind of balls up and it flakes right off. Isn't that so satisfying? <laughs> Here, if the red on your amanita is still wet, then you can take the masking off and get home. And then usually what I do um, when I paint amanitas is because, you know, not, not all of the white uh, veil remnant is perfectly white. So I usually go in with, with a light gray. I don't know if you can see it, but just to drop in a little bit of gray to give it some give it some dimension so let me put here are the examples up top and then kind of where we got to for tonight yeah. So what we'll do right now is I have some little, I have some little, um, you know, artist cards, like if we were doing an art show. So we put, we're going to title your piece so you can, you know, name it Fly Agaric, or you could call it something poetic um, and write your name on it. 
and leave it right at your space. And then I'm going to give each of you two stickers and we'll walk around and look at everybody's work and see how everybody did. And then uh, if you like what somebody else did, put one of your stickers on their piece of paper and we'll go around at the end and see who got the most stickers. And if you're online, then uh, take a picture of your work and then make sure you tag me and Central Texas Mycological Society and um, we'll pick a winner by tomorrow. So if you still have some work to do, you can keep working on it. Um, tag us on Instagram, just post a story of what you worked on and um, we'll announce a winner tomorrow and get your prize mailed to you. Yeah, that'd be great. Do, oh, here's your result. Uh, two, because we'll have two two pieces per person, and then I'll hand out some stickers. And I, I think it'll be cool for you guys to all see kind of the different directions people took, the different. Um, Different outcomes everybody got. And we're not we're not judging based on uh you know fine art accuracy. It's just how fun makes you happy. If you are interested in continuing to work on this or to kind of try it again, because this is our, your first swing at it, if you would like to take any of these tracing sheets that I made, you're, you are welcome to them. Um, if you want to take one home and then start again from the beginning. Do you think there's some more like I would love to. Um, that'll kind of depend on, on what events are available. And um, and I think, who's the who's the gentleman that is doing another mushroom painting? Um, Dennis Benjamin. So I don't know if we'll be doing it online. I'll have to ask him if he wants to do it, do it like that. I think he's ever done it before, but if we are able to get it all online, it can be on Saturday, September 23rd. And he's um, a mycologist from South Africa, but lives in Dallas, Fort Worth. So as you get to a stopping point, um, you can put your, your name and the title of your piece under each one. And we will do a little art walk and just kind of look at the product that everybody made. And you can award two people a sticker and then whoever at the end, the two people with the most stickers, are gonna go home with uh, one of my Wheel of the Year calendars and a snazzy hat. If you are um, finished for the evening and you borrowed any materials, you can return them to the table. You don't have to uh, wash the brushes. I would be happy to put them back in the cup. Um, 
and you need to, um, if you wouldn't mind rinsing the uh, paint palettes at the sink, that would be really helpful. And then we can kind of walk around and take a peek at everybody's work. Uh, no, if you would like to keep the dot card, you're more than welcome to. Um, and if you don't like it, you can leave it back on here. This was really fun. This was really cool to kind of see uh, how everybody interpreted the process. And thank you for the, for the live speckling. Uh, yeah, everybody, if you want to take some of the their um, culinary, edible, Yes, this is uh, it's called liquid masking. It's just enjoyment because it's so cool to see, like, you know, you know, your process. Yeah, you have somebody else. It's one of the things that I share. Yeah. It's time for being on TV.
brushes. You can just put them on, on the table because I'll just roll them up and I'm going to wash them all away. Okay. Um, and then you Yeah, I would love that. You're so welcome. Thank you guys for coming. Do we want it? Because I'd, I'd love if, is this still streaming? Yeah. Yeah, I'd love if maybe we could. Can I take this off and, and walk it around just to kind of show some of the uh, examples? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. And we might even, I mean, are we able to still send that out? This is the, I don't know if this is like recorded or yeah. on the website. There's one more row over here. So if you're following along at home, this is the uh, wheel of the year calendar that you can win along with a hat and a pin from Central Texas Mycological Society. So um, take a picture on Instagram of your work and tag me and Central Texas Mycological Society and we'll pick a winner tomorrow. That's it, because that's what you do. Do you want to end the live stream with yeah. a
Yes. Thank you, everybody, for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to hit leave on here? Yeah. Okay. Bye.